Welcome everybody and namaste. Gongji Fa Shi and Kung He Fa Choi, which is basically Happy New Year in Chinese. Um, I uh, live and work in Hong Kong and I've taught at international schools for the past 27 years. Uh, I'm originally from India, so namaste to all my friends in India. And I've been told by HarperCollins that there are almost 40 countries represented here today. So it's an absolute honor to be amongst the global community of English language teachers. I salute you. And some of you uh, might think that, what is this all about? And I really hope that what I'm here to share with you today is some things that I think I know for sure on English language teaching and learning. So I'm inviting you to keep an open mind and to think deeply about some of the ideas presented today. So here we are. Now language teachers, all of us, are pretty good at languages ourselves. That's why hopefully we've done these jobs. Um, they understand the what and the how of language. We're interested in how languages work. We have a love of its mechanics, its structures. Great. But do we really ask ourselves why we are teaching language? More importantly, why are we teaching language English in the 21st century? What is the point of that? Where is it coming from? Have we reoriented ourselves with why English? So the purpose of this webinar is firstly to examine why we teach English in the 21st century, and then it's to review why and what we teach in English. Now, English is a language that has a fair bit of baggage, some of it colonial, some of it imperial, a history of both glory and injustice in English, but what does it mean today? More importantly, what is transferable directly to the wider world of our students in the 21st century? And then we need to consider how we teach English so that it is student focused, purposeful, and finally a vehicle for intercultural understanding. English has great power in the world today, perhaps more than it's ever had. So how can we make this uh, student focused and important for our populations that we teach. At this point, I'm going to ask you to take a short poll. The question is, I'm sure um, either Yanmin, yes, there it is. How many of you speak a language or languages other than English? And the choices are, I speak and understand one language, one other language, I speak and understand two or more. I'm a balanced bilingual, all four skills and two languages. I'm a multilingual who has more than two languages or all four skills or all of the above are true. So go for it, everyone. Has everybody... So people are still voting. So um, we'll That's just give fine. it a few seconds. So if those of you who aren't sure, there is a poll button at the bottom of your screen. So do click on that and vote. Okay, I'm going to round this up now. Thank you. And share the results. Wonderful. So there's almost 75% of you speak and understand more than two languages or one language. And there's 6% of amazing people who have four or more languages, you wonderful people. Thank you very much, that's great. So as expected, you are all talented linguists and probably have a passion for how language works and what needs to be taught. It's a real honor to be working alongside you. If teaching and, in, and learning the English language is a project, there are several ways to establish a vision of a project. And one of them is by asking why. So Simon Sinek, a British American author and marketing consultant is the person who's developed the golden circle model. And this asks why, how, and what. So according to Sinek, most organizations and leaders know what they're doing and some of them know how they're doing it but very few of them ask themselves constantly why they're doing it. 
And for that reason, leaders and organizations know the purpose of, uh, know very little about the purpose of the things that they're doing. And this is the why, of, which is about motivation for teachers and students. We know that intrinsic motivation is important for each person, but shared extrinsic motivation is really the key to all collaborative learning. So as teachers, we are the CEOs of our own classrooms. We decide the weather, we decide the climate of the classroom, we decide the goals, we decide the objectives. Students pretty much have to trust us that we know what we're doing and why we're doing it. But do we know why? I invite you to ask yourselves that question and then ask students why they are learning language themselves. And in my view, shared purpose is really essential to language learning. So let's begin with the why. Uh, why English for us as teachers? Why do we teach it? Is English the lingua franca? Yes and no, perhaps once, and perhaps now it's the language of globalization. When I moved from India to work and live in Hong Kong, I began to realize that there are many multilingual realities that don't need to work through English alone. I live right next door to 1.4 billion people, a majority of which get on perfectly well without English and have achieved, you might say, a fair bit of success, despite not learning it to the levels that the rest of the world understands. I dare say it might be a more peaceful world if more of the world understood and spoke Putonghua or Hindi. Uh, Putonghua was once known as Mandarin. Uh, so we would understand it each other better. The myth of Babel then is just that, a myth. We are able to communicate with each other. And in fact, it's essential that we communicate well to survive and thrive, especially in the climate of the pandemic and in a world of climate change. Another thought, perhaps the languages of the world are actually based on technology. That language for the most part seems linguistically neutral, but it is a code in its own right. And it's also called the language of technology. Right now, there are computer languages at work in this presentation that are invisible and perhaps incomprehensible to most of us. Yet they are being communicated through our laptops and I'm told that there are languages like C, Java, C++, Python, Perl, Visual Basic. These are universally learnt languages by computer graduates around the world, and they are creating our reality as we speak. We recognize the platforms as Zoom, Microsoft, Google, Google Classrooms, Gmail, Instagram, Facebook, but these languages are being used to communicate with artificial intelligence. We don't understand them, but we actually are using them to communicate with each other, especially in a socially distanced world. So here's the idea I'd like you to hold on to. Language is a medium, an operating system, a way of being and a way of knowing. And those of you who are IB teachers will recognize this as the theory of knowledge idea that language is a way of being and knowing. Um, thanks to a, quite a colonial and imperialistic legacy, English is now used in 101 countries worldwide. And whereas English lags behind in the number of native speakers, it's by far the world's most commonly studied language. Overall, more people learn English than French, Spanish, Italian, Japanese, German, and Chinese combined. So if you look at the, the the maps, um, the sort of diagrams on this uh, slide, you can see that there is a, an imbalance in the number of people who actually um, learn, want to learn English and the number of people who are native speakers of English. Once English was the language of colonization and then globalization, but perhaps English has survived because it is such a flexible polyglot of a language. According to one survey, only one third of English words actually come from Old English. 41% come from French and Old Norman, and at least 15% come from Latin. Another 10% come from a mix of other languages, which include Sanskrit, Hindi, Caribbean languages, Chinese, Romani, um, Japanese, and Old Norse. 
So perhaps now in the 21st century, it's time English was owned by the world as belonging to everyone who uses it, a genuine vehicle for intercultural communication and hopefully a medium for our common humanity. How can we share this with our students? And this is perhaps something that we need to do to share the why of language with our students. Now that we've established the why, let's look at what language, and not just English, all languages, have meant to being human. What is it? It's a way of knowing and being, as I mentioned. It is an operating system for our consciousness to be communicated. On this slide, I've got a quote from Wade Davis. He's a social anthropologist, a very fascinating uh, person who's been looking at the journeys of various languages and cultures. And he says, the ethnosphere is the sum of all thoughts, intuitions, myths, and beliefs, ideas, and inspirations brought into being by the human imagination since the dawn of consciousness from the beginning of time. Now, 2019 was the UN's International Year of Indigenous Languages, yet out of the 7,000 known languages, 230 of these became extinct between 1950 and 2010, very much in our lifetime. Now we lose a language every two weeks, and some estimates warn that 90% of languages will disappear in this century, the 21st century. About 23 of those languages, like on that map I showed you earlier, are spoken by half of the world's population and 3,000 of them are endangered. So as part of our identity as teachers, we need to decide who we are in relation to the teaching of English. The fostering of English as one of the languages spoken by our multilingual students. So I ask you to consider what is your relationship to the other languages of your students? Do you affirm those as equally valid ways of knowing and being? And this is really important to the grand project of teaching English as a vehicle for intercultural understanding, that we understand that it is one way of communicating in the world and not the only way. This is another quote by Wade Davis, and it's, it's a wonderful quote which tells you what language really is. And this is for all languages, not just English. A language is not merely a body of vocabulary or a set of grammatical rules. It is a flash of the human spirit. The means by which the soul of each particular culture reaches into the material world. Every language is an old growth forest of the mind a watershed of thought, an entire ecosystem of spiritual possibilities. The idea of the flash of the human spirit is quite an accurate metaphor for the light bulb idea. Neurolinguists will tell you that it is the flash of an electrochemical signal that tells you a thought has just crossed the synaptic gap between your neurons in your brain. That flash is what becomes language. And then thought becomes an idea or a concept, and that eventually creates action and then creates something. Everything around us was created first as a thought before it became language. There's also a biological metaphor here. Just as we know the health of the biosphere, our world, depends on its biodiversity, the health of what Wade Davis calls our ethnosphere depends on the thriving of our languages. These are our old growth forests of the mind, all of the ideas of humanity. So culture, like language, must be tended and preserved against the odds, ravages of time, modernity, war, pandemic, changes in technology. This is true for all cultures. They need to be tended and preserved, and language is a way to do this. So let's combine the what and the why of teaching English. 
some terrible things are done in the name of English language teaching. I invite you to ask yourself if the English you are teaching is leading to students losing their own languages. Subtractive bilingualism is what happens when students lose their first language and it is replaced tenuously sometimes by English. Or is it additive bilingualism where they can actually add English to their repertoire of languages? Is learning English expanding your students' connections to larger numbers of people? Or is it making them lose connections to their own cultures and ways of being? So being multilingual or bilingual is a fact, as we saw from 75% of us. It is a right which allows us to express ourselves in many ways. And more importantly, it's a resource. It's a resource for the whole world. It's, resource, it's a resource for the people that we live and work with. So human knowledge is coded through multiple ways of knowing and being, and one of those is language. Diversity is therefore a fact, a right, and a resource. To continue the biological metaphor, just as we are understanding that biodiversity points to the health and balance of ecosystems on this planet, we surely need to consider diversity amongst ourselves as a species as essential to the health and well being of humanity. It's a really grand enterprise, and never have English language teachers had such a call to action before. So let's see ourselves as bigger and more important than those bodies that teach the parts of speech and tenses. So why English as a support to bilingualism and multilingualism? How can English become this support? So for too long, you might realize there's been quite a deficit model of viewing multilingual learners in English. So I'm going to ask uh, Jan Min and Charlene to launch a quick poll here to see which of the statements do you think is most true? You may pick more than one option. Please read those carefully. So I'll just leave it up there for a few more seconds. If people want to vote by clicking on the polls uh, button and voting. Okay, it looks like it's, oh, I thought it was slowing down, but it's not. I'll leave it up for a few more seconds and then I That's will. That's great end the poll. Okay. Okay. Well, we've got a majority of people have said that multilingual students may start at a disadvantage, but can catch up quickly with their monolingual peers. Fantastic. That is true. Multilingual learners are advantaged in the long run because they have other ways of knowing and being absolutely correct. Um, the people who said that they need to unlearn and forget their other languages to learn English properly, that is absolutely not true. And I hope the rest of the presentation will help you change your mind on that. And multilingual learners need to learn dominant English culture in order to be successful um, is partially true in some contexts, but not necessarily true at all. Uh, multilingual learners are not at a disadvantage. So that's really what I'm going to try and unpack here. So for too long, there's been this deficit model where we view multilingual learners as students who have other languages as baggage, a bit like that seesaw that you can see on my slide, that the other languages are seen as baggage that weighs them down and they have to shed that baggage um, in order to understand and learn English properly. 
And Francois Grosjean, who is wonderfully bilingual himself, he says that the holistic view of the, of the bilingual is that the bilingual is not a sum of two complete or incomplete monolinguals. You don't just take a student and join them together with two brains and they've got two separate brains. They have a unique and specific linguistic configuration that is really important. And that depends on the languages that they speak. A more useful metaphor for language might be that of a bicycle or a tricycle to represent bilingualism or multilingualism. So a vehicle with two wheels can take you places, a vehicle with three allows you to carry many more things as you can see with this bicycle and needless to say if you've got four wheels as we saw with some of the lucky people who are um, have four strong languages that can really take you places like a car or a truck with four strong wheels. So the, this is the basis of the functional model of language, which I'm going to unpack a little bit. Language is a tool, a vehicle, a medium to express the best of the human condition. And this happens in the context of culture and communication. So I hope this, if you think of languages as wheels, the more you have, the better. Okay. Now let's look at this model for putting the why, the what, and the how together now. Language is a system that takes place within a context. So there is a purpose in the interaction. There is a topic to be discussed. There is a relationship between the people in that interaction, and there is a channel of communication, spoken, written, email, or webinar, as we're doing now. The relationship between context and the language system is dynamic. It goes both ways. And despite the fact that I can't see each one of you, I know that there are 151 of you out there just now, and each of us has entered into this a webinar with a certain expectation regarding what's going to happen here. You're here with the expectation that I will deliver something that you might want to think about. But if I were to break into song or a rap or a diatribe, that would be quite unexpected. So the system is actually controlling us all in this context. So typically, this also falls into the why, the what, and the how. So perhaps for too long in English language teaching, the purpose and the topic have not been relevant to students at the heart of the process. Uh, the relationship between teacher and student in the past, and still unfortunately in many schools, is a power relationship where the native or near native teacher of the language is the sole arbiter of the interaction, the corrector, the giver of information. The student is the recipient not considered to have other language resources to reference and not scaffolding um, their other languages. All language learning is based on prior knowledge, what you already know. And this is true even for babies. They experience the world with their five senses well before language is learned. Some argue that language is really a hypothesis making process for even babies as they agree the vocabulary and the structural conventions of their language and their culture. So babies have already got prior knowledge of lots of things before they learn language. And why would this be any different for second language learners? So I'm going to complicate this a little bit more now, and it's going to be the same diagram that I'm going to build on. So according to Halliday and other functional linguists, in any situation, there are three key factors. The context that affects the choices that we make in a language system. And these choices in context are field, tenor, and mode. The field is the what, the content or subject matter that the curriculum area, subject, and topic, what are we talking about? In this case, we're talking about language. The tenor, who are we? We're all language teachers together, the roles that we play. And hopefully you're presenting me with some status today by giving me this opportunity to speak to you. So that is our relationship, but basically it's a relationship of equals here. 
And then there is the mode, the channel of communication. Is it phone call? Is it written? Is it multimodal as, we as we're doing today? I've got slides, I've got visuals, and that's how I'm unpacking some ideas here for you. So this is the complex part of uh, language teaching and learning. So please ask yourselves, what do you teach? Who do you teach? And how do you teach this? So sometimes it's quite helpful to change the tenor a little bit where the teacher stops being the giver of knowledge and negotiates this information with their students. For example, a good way to melt the tenor barrier might be to pick up a news article of common interest. So something I did with my students recently was um, in the press. Some scientists say it's dangerous to consider Omicron a milder version of the virus. It might just be an evolutionary mistake. And this is quite a difficult article. Um, and it had lots of scientific information. The field was microbiology, really, um, and the language of viruses and variants and so on. And this puts the teachers and the students in the role of receiver that this is a text that has been put out there by somebody who's an expert epidemiologist. And let's unpack this scientific information jointly and translate it into a form that makes sense to us as ordinary consumers of the news and people who are not epidemiologists. And this allows everyone to negotiate the field and to work out how um, this virus works and what hypothesis this particular scientist was making. So as we do this, we start moving from the most written form, quite a dense um, article about all sorts of things to do with, with Omicron as a virus and the spikes and the proteins and so on. And we turn this from that written mode into an accessible spoken negotiation of the text. And given that it's quite topical and of great interest to students as well as teachers, it becomes something that we have to understand together. So that's one example. At this stage, it's really helpful to point out that curriculum in schools has a culture of its own. And every curriculum, every subject has a culture of its own. So I'm familiar with secondary school cultures, science, humanities, mathematics, art, design, technology, etc. And we recognize those in schools and colleges as faculties. If you teach, walk around the corridors of these departments or faculty areas, and you will notice that that culture is all around you. The smell of chemicals, formaldehyde in the science corridor, sometimes sulfur, that familiar smell of rotten eggs. And then in another corridor, you might smell paint and drying easels, or you might hear the whirring of machines in the design technology area. So each of those represents a culture of field. So in language terms, each curriculum is based on genres of reading, writing, and spoken interactions. And this can be ordinary interpersonal communication between science teachers and their students during an experiment, or it could be CALP. And Cummins uses this word, uh, this lovely acronym, which is really useful, and he calls it cognitive academic language proficiency. So how well students negotiate the field of that particular subject and its meanings. How proficient are they with vocabulary, structure, and expectations of each subject area? Typically, students pick these up quickly as they move through the secondary uh, curriculum, but it is our job to make sure they're proficient and conscious that the language of art differs from the language of science or history or geography. So this is where I'm going to bring in um, genres and text types and come to them a little bit later. So what I'm talking about in the what is really academic literacy. And that's the CALP that I just talked about. It's cognitive, it's to do with the brain and it's academic language proficiency. So Halliday says that language is a meaning making process. So students are learning the language, in this case, English, they are learning through the language, the vocabulary and structures of that language, and they are learning about that language, that there are multiple ways that 
uh, words and phrases and vocabulary work in that language. So they're learning through English, they're learning English itself, and they're learning about it, often at the same time. So this is a massive meaning-making process. So we need to honor that it takes time and it takes effort and it takes a lot of support from um, the teachers and people around them, just as we support babies with their first words and their first um, utterances, we really, really need to support English language learners with what they are doing at school. So based on the work of Halliday, Martin um, uh, and Christy uh, developed the genre-based approach. And this is to make, the to make the language demands of the curriculum explicit so that students can understand what's going on in a language. Now, genre is also called text types. This, is, this system is alive and well in Australia and is used extensively across uh, East Asia. I hope it's being used in India and the UAE. Um, as well as in Europe. So what is a genre or a text type? A genre or a text type is a staged goal-oriented way that people get things done. So even pre-language babies, types of crying um, are using genre. So those of you who have children understand very well that babies without language create types of crying so that they can communicate with you. Anything from irritation to pain to hunger to full-blown rage is communicated by a newborn child. So these are staged goal-oriented communications. Babies will let you know that yes, diaper change would be very nice, thank you, to I want my milk and I want it now. So this is a genre in itself, and parents understand this very well. Similarly, if I want to tell a story, I might start with Once Upon a Time or A Long Time Ago. In ancient China, there lived a genie who was unfortunately trapped in a bottle. It is typical in a story to explain time, historical period, and setting to set the scene for a traditional story. And then you introduce characters and so on. However, if we're doing a simple recount, which is just saying what happened yesterday, we go straight to the climax of the story. I had filled up my cart of groceries before I realized I'd left my wallet at home. Fortunately, my next door neighbor said hello just as I was groping around for my wallet. And again, that has its own genre, the setting complication resolution of, of the issue. So stories and recounts are slightly different genres. And some of those are on the screen here for you. Similarly, explanation as a genre, whether for electronic circuits or viruses or tsunamis or earthquakes, all involve the same stages of what, where, why, and how they take place. Usually these are followed by explanations of past phenomena, the 2004 tsunami in, in, uh, in Japan or the one that took place recently in Tonga. So basically they are usually have explanations of a past one when they took place and the stages that were observed uh, by scientists or geographers in the context. So I hope that makes it clear that we really need to let students know that these are distinct genres and they are staged and goal-oriented ways of using language. I'm going to draw your attention to a few more. There are many more than these, but these are the typical ones. Um, and some might have even combinations of these. So for example, in, in geography or science, it's quite typical to have an explanation report that has a descriptive section on viruses or tsunamis or earthquakes. So there could be combinations of genres in um, some subjects. So genres are pretty typical and universal across um, cultures. And, but they might evolve slightly differently depending on the field, tenor, and mode. And for example, all languages have argument. And you may not recognize it as the same genre you're familiar with in your own culture, but argument is one of the oldest forms of human interaction. We have argued our way into nearly every invention, discovery, and paradigm shift. Uh, since the beginning of time. And all cultures argue because human beings like to argue and have differing opinions. 
So it's actually worth letting students know that argument is really a powerful uh, form of communication. And if people are arguing well, it prevents them from uh, resorting to violent means to settle their arguments. Um, and now I'm just going to show you a quick example of how this would unpack in the classroom, the how of language learning, and how would this look in a classroom. So I mentioned argument. So we need to let students know that there are some rituals around argument and they vary from culture to culture. So for example, a typical school debate on global warming or climate change. Now, even these titles, global warming and climate change, are themselves um, tricky vocabulary because climate change suggests a small change in a trend that humans may or may not affect. But global warming, originally coined as global overheating, suggests a far more serious situation which requires immediate action. Now, let's say that, that what we're planning in a classroom is a formal debate, and the purpose is to persuade audience towards the idea that this is an urgent worldwide issue. The mode is spoken, but has the features of a written text. There has to be a point, there has to be evidence, there has to be analysis, there has to be counterclaim, there has to be some emotive uh, expressions, there has to be a structure to the arguments, most important to least important. Quite a difficult genre. So typically, once you've set the task as field, tenor, and mode, it's vital that the field is established. You have to build the field for all language learners. And this is not just English language learners. It's basically all students have to do this because it's cognitive academic language. They have to immerse themselves in the field of global warming. They would have to look at research, visual aids, di diagrams, statistics, and understand the field completely. The positions in the field, the pros and cons. At this stage, it's really essential that students are dealing with chunks or pieces of language, vocab of the field, as well as phrases. And you don't start with nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, it's absolutely pointless. You have to start with ideas and concepts. The greenhouse effect is a concept. CO2 emissions are specific, they have units. Carbon footprint is a metaphor. All of this learning and immersion has a purpose. And the purpose is we must win this debate and critique the points of view in it. So I would suggest to all teachers, please, please use graphic organizers, use cue cards, use concept maps. And all of these are helpful in creating what we call a semantic web, a, meaning feel, a meaningful field full of vocabulary and ideas. It doesn't matter how students will unpack it. Immersing in the field means they're already seeing how these ideas, how these concepts hang together. So we have to build the field. And then we have to establish tenor and practice the mode. Now, this is where some teachers ask me, do all countries and cultures have arguments? Yes. Do they argue in different ways? Yes, indeed. Are some countries ruder than others while they're arguing? It depends on the tenor of the relationships and the modes in which they engage with each other. So please, please avoid generalizations like Chinese people don't really debate or Japanese are too polite to argue or Indians argue too much and so on. These are simply generalizations and stereotypes and they're often not true and create false impressions of culture in students' minds. All cultures, all of these cultures that I just mentioned are famous for their debates and arguments throughout history. Confucius and the Taoists had lively debate as did the Buddha and the Zen monks were trained in the art and science of rhetoric. So really avoid making these stereotypes. It's also um, dangerous to give the impression that debate is a Western concept. I've seen lots of language teachers trying that out. Uh, the idea of debate is really universal. And the idea that it is a time-honored genre needs to be maintained. Although the idea of discussing Christmas parties and lockdown for hours and hours in parliament is indeed a novel use of debate convention. So you could actually use the current debates in the UK to show what lively political debate looks like. 
and this on this wonderful subject. So there's plentiful uh, examples there, quite exciting, complete with polite name calling, heckling and irate adjudicators. So this is something that you can do. Once the tenor and the practice modes are um, shown, you can actually go straight into using the language. So getting students to research it, get together in the debate and then in the practice mode. This allows students to have that purpose, the importance of actually having a joint purpose, a reason to learn vocabulary, a reason to understand what it's all about. So to sum up, uh, what's the difference between traditional language teaching and functional approaches? Um, forgive me, I don't often do this, but I will go through this slide because I think it's vital to summarize the differences in approach. The traditional language teaching approach is a reductionist approach. The language is made up of parts, nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, prepositions, and so on. And that sort of takes away the holistic cultural nature of language. It's a living organic being. And if you cut it up into little pieces, that doesn't always work for students. The functional holistic approach, on the other hand, says that language is a living, breathing, social, psychological, political um, thing that has cultural functions. It's part of our common humanity. We all have language. The traditional method ignores culture and teaches that this language belongs to this dominant culture. The holistic approach says that culture is a context for all language and all languages have culture and this governs the inter uh, interactions that take place and there is intercultural understanding. Lang languages might do um, relationships slightly differently. Sees language as a set of rules in the traditional approach. The rules have a permanent structure and in the holistic approach, sees language as a dynamic meaning-making process, a resource, and it's constantly changing. As you know, we're all very well versed with the vocabulary of the pandemic now, and that is a field that we've built around us as, as the situations unfolded. So we all understand um, you know, the full implications of some of these words now. Um, in traditional language teaching, there's a top-down pedagogy. The teacher is the sole giver or presenter of knowledge. And the functional holistic approach says that it is a collaborative pedagogy where the teacher and students jointly construct and negotiate language for a shared purpose. Sometimes traditional language teaching can feel dry and pointless, endless worksheets, lots of practicing, grammar exercises, and the learner feels increasingly disempowered. And that's when some of the subtractive bilingualism can happen, where they start forgetting their own first languages. On the other hand, this is much more exciting. It's building and negotiating a joint field. It's creating new developments and it's learner centered. There is a purpose to it. It is powerfully important to learn the language of global warming because the purpose is a debate. So this is a shift in really how we should be approaching teaching and learning of language. So in the, this is for another webinar, which is how does one teach the systemic functional approach? There is a teaching and learning cycle. We can unpack this at another time. And I'm going to leave you with this idea that academic languages construct meaning and they lead to achievement and there's the capacity to make meaning that we're constantly developing. And coming to my last slide, what I really want to leave you with is that if you want your learners to learn language to paint by number, as you can see with the lovely dog on the left side of this slide, then it will look like a dog because they are painting by the numbers that you have assigned to each part of the dog. Um, and this kind of work is what you will get when a student has followed all your instructions. So I think we're all familiar with the traditional approach where we say use two verbs, three adjectives and two adverbs in the present tense to say what happened when you went to the beach on Sunday. And you get 25 or 30 or 50 or 60 identical responses that are painted by number or language by number. So. I'm suggesting that if the purpose 
the why of language learning is social and intrinsically motivated, why would you not allow students to see how the colors and the words and the phrases mix together? If, they, if you want to create a work of art, like the ones on the right, then you can't paint by number. You have to mash those colors together. You have to see how they blend and you have to see which ones work together. So reading narrative or descriptive essays needs to be a constant surprise to the language teacher. So you've got to be able to be looking at descriptive pieces of work as an art teacher would look at different pieces of art, that each one is unique and quite powerful, as these pictures on the right indicate. Yet at the same time, each student start, is well aware of how those colors mix and blend together. So one disclaimer here is that you might need to teach students for non um, fictional genres, that there are actually rules, for example, in lab reports, etc. that there are stages and goals that have to be completed. But I'm talking here about the creative palette of language that you want to give each learner. So I'm going to leave it there with that metaphor, and hopefully we're doing okay for time. And I'll stop there to say, what kinds of reading and writing would you like to have? Paint by number and write by number or um, paintings? Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Eva, for such an insightful webinar. It looks like everyone's enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> Uh, just before we go on to questions, um, I just want to reiterate what I said at the beginning of the webinar that we will be sending everyone today's webinar recording and an attendance certificate for you to refer back to. And my colleague has just pasted a link to the attendance certificate into the chat box if you want to download it now. Um, so also just if you want to get in touch with us uh, about the webinar or any um, sort of query you may have, please oh, email us. That, that's fine, don't that worry. <laughs> um, please email us at collins.international at harpercollins.co.uk. Um, and yeah, so now we'll go on to some really nice questions we've got in the Q&A box. So can everybody see the um slide or have i stopped sharing i think you've stopped sharing that's okay. fine i'll no just problem. bring that up again so everyone can see that while we're doing questions all right thank okay. you so much um so the first question i've got here is please could you share uh, an example of field tenor and mode with respect to english fiction or poetry maybe okay um I think that field tenor mode, because if you look at the vocabulary and concepts in a poem, um, you know, say daffodils or cherry blossoms and so on, you'll find that the field of, um, of poems, especially poets who are interested in, um, in flowers, for example, as a theme or love as a theme, poetry is pretty universal in its field. So you must get students to try and think about what other poems they've read that are similar to this one. If it's entirely alien to them in terms of its field, it would be a good idea to unpack what the concepts and ideas and the purpose of the poem. So back to the what, the why, and the how of the poem and why that poet wrote it. Um, was he feeling wonderful looking at a field of flowers or was he feeling sad or was he missing a loved one or was it a seasonal poem? So there are certain um, common themes in the field. And then the tenor, the relationship between the poet and who he's writing the poem for or his audience or his readers at the time. And then the mode, which is, again, did he read it out? I mean, some Shakespearean dialogue is poetry. So did, was it read out? Was it enacted? Was it spoken? Was it written? It is quite helpful. Um, so I think looking again at things like fiction and poetry as universal to the human condition is really helpful when we're trying to teach them. So don't teach English poetry as if English people are the only people who ever wrote poetry. Uh, try and see where poetry has appeared in the students' 
um, experience before. And it's really helpful to find poems, uh, getting students to choose poems of their first language that really they really enjoy. Lovely answer, thank you. Um, the next question I've got is, um, could you share some tips to help us, the English as a second language teacher, to convince students that being bilingual or multilingual is important? Um, sorry, who was that from? Uh, Tam Tamara? Tamara, yeah. Tamara, um, I think there's some fantastic neurolinguistic neuro neuro research and some psycholinguistic research that says that bilingual people actually hold on to their memories for a lot longer. Um, and so basically the idea that Alzheimer's um, patients, there have been studies on bilingual Alzheimer's patients and they actually have five to 10 years longer in their memory uh, if they're multilingual. And there's some wonderful stuff related to well-being and resilience in the brain. So some great research to show that you really have multiple operating systems. I use um, the computer analogy quite a lot to say that it's almost as if you have a computer that has both windows and Microsoft operating at the same time if you've got two languages. And surely that makes for a more powerful uh, machine, <laughs> which language can help you to access. So I think that's quite um, a, a way to convince them. There's lots of research out there now in this area, Tamara. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Molly has asked, how do we actually lose a language? That oh, very easily, Molly. So if you don't use it, you lose it. It's very simple uh, because the brain stops storing uh, vocabulary, concepts, etiquettes around that language. So it's very easy to lose a language and very quickly over time. Absolutely. Um, she's also asked, is it not possible for traditional language teaching to be learner centered as well by having different learning stations and giving various different activities? Oh, absolutely. It can be uh, quite learner-centered, but if you want it to be consistent, it's quite exhausting, the traditional method, um, to, to just keep delivering. Um, so if you want it to be collaborative and to keep students' interest, it actually takes the pressure off the teacher um, in this kind of approach where it's jointly negotiated and students are bringing language to the situation rather than you providing it. So I would say it creates longer term resilience to have the functional approach. Great. And um, the next question is, is there a structure for the student reinventing the language purposefully or purpose? I think it means purposefully, purposefully. <laughs> for use at a more wider level. So creating terms and linguistic ideas that get drafted into a worldwide usage. Absolutely. So I think once um, students learn that everything around them is language and everything really has a field tenor mode, whether you're going into studying computer science or epidemiology or uh, bacteria or, um, or, or you're going to be in the medical field, um, that actually develops a long term resilience. Everything uh, beyond high school is pretty much academic language proficiency. Um, it's just at various levels. So it has some really powerful long-term impacts. Perfect. Thank you, Shiva. Um, we've got a few more minutes, so I don't know if you want to leave our audience with something to reflect upon and to summarize. <sighs> Um, I think I'll go back to what I said before. Um, I think as language teachers, we have a call to action. We are here to help students create intercultural understanding um, for a more peaceful world, hopefully, um, to create joint solutions to some pretty serious problems that are facing humanity as a whole. Um, and we're, we're quite important to creating a climate of excitement around language. And I, I will leave you with this one thing. Students really, really need to be able to analyze things like arguments. And the more tools you give them, the less likely they are to be fooled um, by arguments that make no sense or are fake news or haven't got enough evidence. Um, so I think there's a critical thinking component 
there as well. So it is really, really important to um, have that purpose in your language teaching. And it doesn't matter what you're teaching. It's really important to have that. Lovely. Thank you, Shiva. Um, I think we're going to wrap it up there. So thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you on the next one. Take care. Thank Bye. you.